Uh, now we are ready for our next speaker for today. Now I think that we all know uh, that it's good for us to be outdoors, to enjoy our green nature. Uh, but how, would you, how do we get areas within our landscape and cities uh, so that we can access nature? Now our next speaker will talk to us about how this can be done and uh, how we can get healthy, green, spaceive and inclusive landscapes. Now welcome. Uh, Dr. Catherine Ward Thompson, a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Edinburgh in the UK. Hi and welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I hope you can hear me clearly. I can hear you and I can see your presentation very Good. well. So uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I can't be with you in Uppsala. It would be lovely to be there, but I'm speaking from my office in Edinburgh. Um, and thank you for the introduction. So I'm talking about um, the salutogenic environment, a phrase that's been used to talk about the environment that supports good health as opposed to problematic environments, obesogenic or other uh, carcinogenic, those kind of environments. And in our research, Open Space Research Centre is the centre that I direct here at the University of Edinburgh. We focus on a socio-ecological approach to well-being, which the bottom line means everything matters. And tragically, in today's world, we know with climate change that even the outermost circle of this diagram is one that we as human beings have changed and can change to the detriment of our health. Um, and we know at the centre are the important individual attributes and characteristics that we as individuals have. But an area that I'm interested in as a landscape architect is the blue uh, series of circles towards the outer edge there, the natural environment, the built environment and the activities that are afforded within it. Because these are things that are well within our control and we can design them for good or for ill, we can manage them to support us or not. And as these are a very important part of our health and well-being, it's important to understand what difference they can make to that. This is a busy middle meadow walk in Edinburgh, an example of a community space with trees that is very actively used by all its citizens. And public health now recognises that it is really important to uh, take an ecological approach to 20th century health because we cannot simply focus on treating illness if we're going to support good health in all of our citizens into the 21st century. Um, a, a more selfish view from a public health perspective might be, well, if we invest in environmental interventions, it pays off because we have fewer people ill. So uh, the cost of dealing with health is transferred to somebody else's department, not the public health department. Um, but if we think about sustainable urban development and sustainable development goals uh, in an international way, then clearly a healthy environment is one that supports all of the natural environment, and that includes an environment for human beings to thrive in and flourish. Now, this isn't new. Um, any of you who know your history of landscape design or public parks will know that public parks uh, have been seen as important elements of uh, health provision within cities for hundreds of years. They were labelled the lungs of the city in London in the 18th century and the public park movement in the 19th century in the UK and across Europe and North America was very much fuelled by the idea that um, public health could be damaged by living in cramped urban conditions, which the Industrial Revolution in particular produced. And what we need is something that allows people to get out into fresh air, but also a natural environment from the very cramped, densely uh, populated areas that many industrial workers lived in in the 19th century when they flocked into towns as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Now, what's interesting is that uh, landscape architects like Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed a number of public parks in North America, most famously, most famously Central Park in New York City, here he is talking in the 19th century about the artificial conditions of the town. And although he's talking in 19th century terms, it's actually remarkably prescient of what we might think today, that 
Modern urban living produces a harmful effect on your entire mental and nervous system. Um, the, your entire constitutional organization can be affected by the urban environment in which you live. And Frederick Law Olmsted and his English um, architect colleague, Calvert Vox, who worked with him on these projects, uh, believed that the antidote was pleasing rural scenery. I'll come back to Olmsted later on because um, some of his writing remarkably reflects um, what we know in late 20th and 21st century psychology. Just to remind you, I'm sure um, you're, you're perhaps aware of the literature that there has been a burgeoning research in uh, links between green blue space, which is shorthand for natural environments that may be designed like public parks and also slightly less designed places, riversides or perhaps wilder areas outside the urban environment. It's green blue space is a kind of shorthand for all of that. And there are a number of studies um, that have shown uh, even when you take income level into account, and we know income level is the best predictor of longevity and of health in general, um, that living near more green space means that you have reduced mortality rates um, and actually reduced morbidity too generally. So we know that green to blue space is salutogenic. What policymakers are particularly interested in is that this is also what has been termed equigenic. The difference, as we know, between rich and poor people's health reflects that socioeconomic variability, uh, sadly, even in today's advanced societies. But if you have more green space in the environment, then there is less difference between the rich and the poor, between the socioeconomically advantaged and those who are disadvantaged. So it reduces health inequalities, and it's very difficult to do that at an individual level. Being able to do that at a societal level through public green space, for example, is very attractive. What lies be behind these links between health and green space? Uh, and many of these are mental associations. In fact, the evidence for links between um, physical health, cardiovascular health, for example, and green space, as opposed to psychological or mental health, um, show that the psychological benefits are, are perhaps the strongest. Um, we know that many people walk when they're outside in a natural landscape. In fact, almost all of us of what any age are more active outdoors than indoors. Uh, so we're likely to be more physically active. That's good for our cardiovascular health. But we also know that walking and physical activity has positive effect on our mood and our stress. So it will be benefiting our mental health as well. Um, and we're particularly conscious of the issue of social engagement in a post-COVID world. Um, Natural environments are only one kind of public open space or semi-public open space where we can come in contact with others, but they can be very important. We know, particularly for older people, that social isolation is an independent health risk factor. Um, many of our older people, particularly women, live on their own. Um, and the kind of informal social contact that you can have in a shared garden or a public open space where you might see a neighbour, smile at them. You may not know them by name, but it's enough of a social contact to feel connection, to feel less isolated. That can be very important for um, feelings of mood uh, or depression uh, and can help build social bonds that are positive social connectedness. Uh, there's a theory developed, among others, by Rachel and Stephen Kaplan, specific to um, landscapes that uh, allow for attention restoration. Uh, very briefly, um, we know that our urban lives and the way we uh, do our work d uh, demands uh, attention that is focused. And that's good, that's fine, but that a focused attention becomes exhausted. And the Kaplans have theorised what kind of environments allow us to restore that exhausted attention resource. And natural environments are not the only places that can, but they are particularly good places for restoring our attention. In particular, they offer what's been called soft fascination, um, effortless attention. They engage us, they engage our mind, our senses, our smell, sight, hearing, but we don't have to make any effort to do it. And that's very attractive to us. And then there's an increasing body of research that shows there are physiological responses to being in natural environments that have a whole range of health benefits um, uh, indicated by psychoneuroendocrine mechanisms, 
um, healthier immune functioning, parasympathetic nerve activity, which enables us to recover from particularly stressful events. Um, and uh, Terry Hartig, among others, your own Terry Hartig, based in Uppsala, has done some key work in this area. Um, so it, uh, it has been hypothesized that our evolutionary origins for most of humankind's existence, we've been surrounded by natural environment. So it's not surprising that we might respond to it and to an unthreatening natural environment in a positive way. And just one example of this from a colleague, Rich Mitchell, based in Glasgow University, whom I've worked with on a number of projects, looking at the difference between being physically active in an urban environment, such as uh, a gym, and being physically active in a natural environment. And he looked at data across the UK, where, how physically active people were and where they were physically active. And people who used natural environments had lower risk of poor mental health compared with those who didn't. Um, so this is very interesting. Yes, it's good for your health to be physically active, but being physically active in a natural environment is not just good for your cardiovascular health, it's also good for your mental health. And here's a lovely quote from Frederick Law Armstead, a slightly earlier one than the one I showed you previously from 1865, which um, it's delightful because it talks about this restorative landscape in a way that, that seems very familiar to 21st century psychology. It employs the mind without fatigue and yet exercises it, tranquilizes it and yet enlivens it. Through the influence over mind of body, re gives refreshing rest and reinvigoration to the whole system. Now this psychophysiological response that is described here, I think we increasingly know there's evidence that it, it really does exist. We know that chronic stress is bad for our physical health as well as our mental health. And we know that if green or green blue space can, can reduce or buffer this load, then it will benefit our entire physiology, mental health and physical health. And we've been involved in um, some studies using salivary cortisol, patterns of diurnal salivary cortisol as an indicator of stress in very deprived urban communities in Scotland. And to our surprise, we found that we could predict better mental health according to a healthier diurnal slope of cortisol um, by uh, whether the person lived in a deprived urban area that had more green space or less green space around it. We also um, surveyed people. We, we try not just to instrument people up, um, but also to ask them questions about how they feel. Um, and not surprisingly, perhaps there was also a link in the data between green space and social well-being, linked with a sense of place belonging. Uh, and it's possible that this is um, a mediator between having high levels of green space and lower stress, a sense of place belonging. Um, and perhaps those of you who are enthusiastic about gardening will know very well how um, engaging in gardening um, can be uh, an important uh, way to de-stress, um, but we think also that beyond perhaps place belonging and the physical exercise, it may be that particularly shared, shared gardening space allotments or gardens uh, confer a social connectedness on people that is really beneficial as well. We've done a lot of research with older people over many decades um, and they tell us the same thing. Um, and as I've said, many of our participants are, are older women living on their own, so getting out and about is part of engaging with wider society, very important. A load comes off my mind when I go out. I have a different feeling about myself when I get home after being out. Uh, and talk about the seasons, um, the changing seasons, engaging with the natural environment, seeing the change in the colours of plants, hearing the bird song. We get repeated reports of this as being really important for people's well-being. Um, and although I haven't personally done research on this and thinking back to the previous talk, we know that getting out into daylight is really good for um, keeping our circadian rhythms. That means that we sleep well at night um, up, to, uh, up to scratch. We know that being outside in sunlight is good for our bone health through vitamin D. And particularly we women as we age, we need to look after that too. So there are many reasons why getting out and into daylight actually physiologically as well as psychologically will do us good. A recent project called Mobility, Mood and Place has explored 
how we can work with older people and understand what aspects of engaging with the outdoor environment make mobility easy, enjoyable and meaningful for older people. I haven't got time to give you all of the results of uh, what was a very large project. Um, but this, is, this, is, this photograph is one that journalists always pick up on. Oh, looks a bit exciting, a bit of technology. You know, what did you do there? It was very exploratory. If there are any um, neuroscientists in the audience, I'm, I'm not an expert. This was an exploratory opportunity to take advantage of some new gear um, with a group of very plucky older participants. Um, this is actually one of our PhD students, but we invited our older participants to um, wear this neural headset which measured um, neural activity while they were walking out and about in the real environment. So we got um, very accurate time-based response uh, to being in a busy urban street or a different kind of space. Very exploratory, I have to say. Um, but we uh, invited our participants to walk in, in a typical urban park, not a very wonderful, beautifully designed one. Um, we, they were working in what we called, so that was the urban green, urban quiet, in a residential street with little gardens in front, so quite a quiet place with some natural environments, and then urban busy, a street with shops and a lot of traffic on it. And um, I haven't got time to go into detail, but I have the, the references you can look up afterwards if you're interested. Low beta associated with alert states or directed attention. This graph shows that people had very high beta when they were in a busy urban setting, and that dropped very dramatically when they first go into a green setting, and it then levels off a bit but stays low. But we don't see the mirror image when people go from a green space into a busy urban space. Um, so there seems to be some kind of buffering. Having been in a green space, that allows people to cope better with the attention demands of a busy urban environment. And we think that attention restoration theory is perhaps one, one explanation for this pattern. Um, directed attention is demanded in busy urban environments, and this is particularly true as we get older. You know, perhaps our hearing is not so great. We may have peripheral vision loss. We may be slightly less mobile than we used to. So we have to pay quite a lot of attention to navigate, to cross a busy street, to not avoid um, someone's bicycle or whatever. And so having a green space, having a place where, as part of our, our time in the urban environment, we can chill out we can relax, we can restore our attention, helps us manage better and more safely indeed the urban environment as well as improving our mood. And another exploratory but very interesting piece of research which we're following up with, with further research now, I was working with my health geography and epidemiology colleagues on this, uh, working with a birth cohort, the one we focused on most was a birth cohort, people born in 1936. So in their 80s, um, and we mapped for each decade of their lives how much green space was close to where they lived in the Edinburgh and Lothian region. And we found that we could predict better cognitive health in later life from whether or not they lived within 800 metres of a park at the age of 11. Astonishing, but we could see a significant difference, a small but significant difference. And so we're seeing lifelong effects of potential access to green and blue space that could be health supporting. Uh, another outcome that we looked at, apart from uh, cognitive decline, was mental health, anxiety and depression. And again, we found patterns of green space influence over the life course. Now, these were limited to the most socially disadvantaged neighbourhoods, but that's really interesting because if we want to address social inequalities in health, then this shows uh, the importance of green space. Green space access during childhood makes a difference, and for anxiety, every decade of life near more green space makes a difference once you get over 70 years of age. Lots of complexity still to unpack about what's behind all this, but it suggests that there is a lifelong pattern of association for mental health and being able to take advantage of the benefits of green space to support good mental health in, in an ageing society. What about people without good childhood experience of nature or green blue space? A really big challenge in today's society as well. 
Um, and just to finish up, mentioning some work we've done over many decades with Forestry Commission in Scotland, now called Scottish Forestry. This is some very early work and some quotes which just reinforce to us the value of nearby woodlands for people who felt comfortable using them, how you could keep walking, you could get away from the city, but also a lovely quote about getting you away from everyday life. You go away and be in a world of your own, very much like that soft fascination the Kaplans talked about. If you're angry at anything, you can just go away, get yourself all calmed down. A beautiful quote that sums up the potential mental health benefits. And this is just an infographic we produced from some work we did with Scottish Forestry looking at a program called Woods in and Around Town, how woods might be improved near areas of high deprivation to increase people's access to restorative environments, environments that might support better health. Of course, natural environments on their own can't, can't address all of the problems that many socioeconomically deprived people suffer, but they can maybe help those people to cope better with the other stresses in their lives that they have to deal with. And I just want to highlight two things in this slide. One is that it's been estimated recently that poor mental health in Scotland, if you add all the different things, days lost to work, the costs of treatment and so on, is nearly £2,000 per person. And the kind of interventions we were looking at through Forestry Commission cost about £15 per person. So you can see that, although you, um, the effect may be small, you don't need very much of an effect for this to be a very cost-effective kind of intervention. And we're currently engaged in a project which looks across Scotland at all of these interventions. Uh, so at a population level scale, uh, looking at child development outcomes and mental health in adults. So I shall finish there by just saying some but not all of the research because of the timing of this is, is found, um, mine and others, in this report for WHO European Region on Urban Green Spaces and Health published in 2016 and a further report on Urban Green Space Interventions and Health in 2017, a good resource as well as our own website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, since this is a, a summit with participants from actually all over uh, our globe, um, what can you tell us about research and work within your field in different countries? Uh, are there very uh, variations in how the different countries work with this? Um, I think there's a lot of commonality across the UK, um, Europe and North America. There have been several European level projects that have looked at these kind of issues as well. A recent one, a colleague of mine in open space was involved with across Europe and he works in Estonia as well, was, was on blue health in particular, so looking at water related uh, natural environments. Um, but there's also some really interesting research coming from Japan and Korea on Shinrin-yoku, which you may have heard of, forest bathing, which is the idea of immersing, bathing, immersing yourself fully in a forest environment. And uh, these experiments have uh, recorded a whole range of psychophysiological responses to that environment that seem to be responding to smell, to fight on sides, to natural microbes, in the environment um, that benefit mental and physiological well-being, increased uh, uh, immune system functioning and so on. Very interesting. And we have a lot of Chinese students very interested in our research now, and there's, that's just starting to burgeon, I think, as well. So I think we're going to see a lot more research coming from the Asian Pacific region that will be very interesting and address uh, some of their particular very dense urban environments and high-rise urban environments as well. Thank you. Very interesting. You have some questions in the chat. Uh, first, uh, someone said, fantastic, Catherine. <laughs> so very okay. good. How do, we create, uh, how do we create the right interprofessional learning infrastructure across Sweden and Europe for this area? Well, um, as it happens, I'm involved in developing a European research project at oh. the moment <laughs> with a lot of lovely Swedish colleagues, I have to say. Um, not, not from Uppsala at the moment, I don't think, although we can always change that. Um, but looking very much at how to bring together public health interests, nature-based therapy approaches in particular, 
and our understanding of what works and doesn't. I think we now find um, there's enough evidence that there's some kind of link there that perhaps the, the next step is not, not to demonstrate that anymore, but to demonstrate how we can intervene most effectively and, of course, most cost-effectively to make a difference to people's lives. Excellent. Thank you. That will be interesting to see then later on. Uh, another question. How can we ensure effective knowledge transfer between the health sector and urban planners and builders? Well, that's a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> um, I've had to, you know, I'm a landscape architect, so my training is in um, planning, designing and managing the physical environment. I know how to deal with planning and development control, but I've had to learn a language of public health and medicine to speak to my public health colleagues in a way that they would be convinced by. Um, so uh, I think uh, learning each other's language is very important. But also, um, certainly in Scotland at the moment, and I expect this is happening throughout Europe, post, uh, throughout the world actually, hopefully, um, in, in the time of the, the COVID pandemic, we've been having meetings convened by the Scottish Government and by Public Health Scotland to say, how should we, how should we grow back better after the pandemic? What, should we, what lessons should we learn? How should we do things differently? And I'm talking in... Uh, meetings about the evidence that I'm being producing and other colleagues have been producing uh, to show that maybe we need to think more uh, creatively about access to public green space and private green space. Should we be developing our housing in a different way so that everybody has private green space as well as public green space so that if they have to be locked down again, they can still get out. Mm. Um, should we be giving so much space to vehicles on roads? Maybe we can give a bit more space to trees and pedestrians and people on bicycles. Um, talking about 20-minute or 15-minute neighbourhoods as ways of having uh, public space and green space nearby where everyone lives and where they go if they need to buy food or get to work or whatever. Mm. So um, these fora are needed but we need to learn each other's language and we need to find ways to work across the silos. You know, the budgets are given in different silos um, and there's a real challenge in getting different uh, areas of, of, of those silos to share their budgets, to think collectively about what's the best way forward. But I think, I think there are hopeful signs that we can start doing that. Yeah, and maybe it is a, a momentum now with the politicians after the pandemic. Indeed. So, yeah. Indeed. Okay, uh, now there's a question from Terry Hardig. Uh, wonderful to hear you. Interesting as always. Uh, what is your view on the possibilities of designing urban environments that do not impose a burden of stress on members of the population? Well, ha. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think there's ever going to be an environment that's completely stress free. Um, and, and of course, you know, those, those stress responses are there evolutionarily to help us manage with the challenges of our lives. So um, I think what we want to try and remove are unnecessary stresses, stresses that we don't need. You know, we, we place stresses on ourselves deliberately in order to have fun when we go running or cycling or doing some very energetic sport because we get pleasure out of um, stressing ourselves and proving ourselves. So we need places we can do that. I think it's the um, busy, trafficked urban environments. That, uh, the more I look at how our streets seem to be dominated by vehicles and their noise and their pollution, which we know is bad for us, um, how have we let our urban environments become so given over to that as a priority? Whatever the politicians may say about priority given to pedestrians or whatever, it often is not reflected at all in how our cities look and function. So that's one big area. Um, there are a range of things, of course, that are stress-inducing that a physical environment alone can't address. Um, if we don't have a job, if we don't have enough money to buy food, um, an attractive environment is not going to resolve that. Um, but there are many stresses, uh, relationships, anxiety about where the next meal is coming from, where having an environment that we can relax in may help us cope with that better, manage that better. Mm -hmm. Places where our children can let off steam, learn about nature, um, 
understand that nature is a resource that allows us to let off steam, to relax, to chill out, so that when we get stressed later on in our lives, we can go back to those kind of places and know they can offer us a restorative experience. All of these things, I think, will help support good health. Um, I, I wish I had the answer to how to have a stress-free urban environment, but I actually don't think that's necessarily really possible. No. But, but you're on your way, I think, it sounds like, in your research and everything that you do. Uh, one last question. If you look ahead uh, a, a couple of years or in the future, what do you see within your field uh, when it comes to research or, or changes, do you think? What, what can you see in the future for your, for your field of expertise? I think that the question I often get asked as a landscape architect is then, so what particular designs are better or worse? You know, is this park better than that park? Mm. And it's a really complex issue because, of course, every landscape, as every individual, is different. Um, they, they're located geographically in a different place and they have different characteristics of geology and soil and um, different uh, slope variation, whatever topography. So every landscape is idiosyncratic, but and, and this is actually interesting because it links in with the work of Swedish colleagues in SLU, in Alnarp, who've uh, done work over many decades on using a therapeutic garden for stressed out uh, women in particular. They've been trying to explore the particular qualities of different kinds of landscape design that offer support for people at different stages in mental health recovery from burnout, from stress, for example. And we might start to be more sophisticated in understanding different kinds of mental illness and the kinds of environments that are particularly supportive for people at different stages in their recovery, as well as, of course, landscapes that uh, support people in maintaining good health so they don't get so stressed in the first place. So I think refining our understanding of what qualities of the landscape and how therefore we might design better to offer the, to afford different health supporting landscapes is, is the next stage, certainly for me and my colleagues. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being with us here today.